Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session, this afternoon session. I have with me Dr. Goodman. Um, and the session is on challenging LARC placements, removal, and counseling. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Goodman, you are good to go. Great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. So glad that you're able to join us. So I'm Suzanne Goodman. I go by the pronoun she, her, hers. And I am with the Bixby Center for Global Reproductive Health, um, the Beyond the Pill program. And we're gonna be, yeah, talking about challenging IUD and implant placements, removals, and some counseling issues. And I don't have any financial relationships to disclose. We'll talk a little bit about off-label indications. And I always just like to point out that the practicum doesn't really replace the FDA and Expelon training, which as you probably know is a um, longer training. Um, it also does not represent any of the opinions of the companies. I don't have a relationship. I used to be a, an Expelon trainer, but I haven't been for some years. Um, just a moment to, to um, tell you about Beyond the Pill. We are a program that uses research and uh, educational uh, platforms to work on with, with organizations ac around the country to improve both access and patient autonomy uh, for the use of contraceptive methods. Uh, we, though we, we focus on IUDs and implants, we don't uh, promote those over other uh, methods and we, we are really uh, advocating um, patient-centered counseling and in, uh, all sorts of different uh, methodologies that really help uh, improve patient autonomy and decision making. So we're just going to be talking about a number of cases and I'm just going to be going over some hands-on tips and strategies uh, as well as a little bit of the evidence for um, particularly both IUD and implant insertions and removals. We'll talk a bit about pain, pain management techniques, uh, a little about vasovagal prevention, particularly with IUD insertion, although that can be an issue with any intrauterine procedures. And then I'll um, also touch a bit on shared decision-making for common patient complaints. So yeah, just to start on that note, we know that shared decision-making um, and patient-centered counseling both helps improve contraceptive knowledge, but it's also really associated with a number of other patient outcomes. Um, one of those is patient satisfaction really goes up if there is less directive counseling and more of a shared decision-making process. And also the continuation of methods. So patients are more likely to choose method, but they're also more likely to adhere to whatever their chosen method is. Um, this uh, framework really also applies to working with complex cases in terms of, uh, you know, checking in with the patients about what their preference is, giving them giving them an idea of the, I, the, the notion that removal is going to be feasible today, essentially the same day, and seeing whether they're open to talking about alternatives. Uh, this is, of course, if removal is the issue at hand. We'll, we'll talk more about that in the context of a case. But whatever issue is at hand, I think if you can give them um, some open dialogue about what their hope for is for the day, some reassurance, uh, and then moving into talking about options if they're open to talking about management options. So first we're gonna focus on a few IUD cases and just wanna give you a little background to that. Um, when I think about the consent process for IUD, um, and some of you are working with written consent consents that you can use have and have patients review. Uh, and these things can be both in a written form or you can take the time to go over them. Um, it's important to have a conversation about pain and discomfort that they might expect. Um, some of the other things that can happen are expulsion, which is about two to 10 per hundred in different studies, but most of the studies sort of trend towards about five uh, five percent or five and a hundred. Perforation is pretty rare, although I always like to acknowledge that it's particularly for new providers, it's one of the, you know, our big fears. Um, but it really happens about one in a thousand. Um, pregnancy with an IUD in place is about one in 2000. Although I often feel like it's more common just because those are some of the cases that we see back 
but the data shows it's one in 2000. Ectopic is even less common. That's one in 4,000. But when I, when I say that, I like to also clarify what is meant that uh, that is because these methods are so effective, IUDs and implants are so effective that pregnancies overall are less common. But if you have a pregnancy with an IUD in place, then you need to rule out an ectopic. Um, ascending infection or PID is a slight risk for about 20 days uh, and then goes back to baseline risk. And then just also talking about the notion that removal upon request is something that, um, that you can, can respect. Um, there are a number of signs of possible complications that you want to mention to patients, bleeding, cramping, signs of infection, pain with intercourse, uh, a missed period with other signs of pregnancy, and um, a sh shortening or lengthening of the strings or missing strings. I usually have patients feel the strings after I place an IUD, but I do no, not any longer recommend that they check their own strings on a regular basis unless they find it reassuring. So the first case we're going to talk about is a 19-year-old nulliparous patient, and you go to do the bimanual exam prior to an IUD insertion, and you note a very anti-flexed uterus. And then you go to sound, and there is difficulty sounding beyond about two centimeters. As um, many of you know, that, that uh, well, I'll just say the typical depth for, it, for the uh, internal Oz is about three to five centimeters. So that's really, you know that you're not through that internal Oz, and you have a gritty dense, dead end sensation. So I'd like to think briefly about differential diagnosis and management. Actually, I just want to also give a quick uh, um, kind of disclaimer. We don't have polls in this, in this presentation, but I am going to be asking some questions and then uh, just going over the answers. So when we talk about differential diagnosis, really the number one uh, reason that people don't get into the cervix is because of uterine flexion. And this really puts a lot of attention on the need to do a good exam um, or the assistance of doing a good exam. And I'll just mention one thing that I do, it, uh, I, actually three quick things that I do. One is to feel where is the cervix? Generally a posterior cervix facing towards the table is more likely to be an antiverted or anti-flexed, this is the cervix. Um, a, uh, if the cervix is facing towards you, this is hard to model, cervix is facing towards you, it's more likely to be a mid-position uterus. And if the cervix is more anterior or even tucked under the symphysis, it's more likely to be a retroverted or retroflexed. One other thing that can be helpful is sweeping behind the cervix and in front of the cervix, in addition to feeling, to see on, if you can feel the abdomen. Other reasons can be an inaccurate exam, which none of us are perfect at our exams, um, or that the patient is, um, is a nulliparous patient. That is really less, um, I think, less of an issue um, once you really get good at doing your exams. And then, yeah, there are some always good things to keep in your differential diagnosis. Those include uh, fibroids, which is going to be very uncommon in a young patient. Uh, Stenosis, again, very uncommon in our, our teen and adolescent uh, uh, patients or nulliparous patients, um, partly because we're not, not really doing uh, cone biopsies or, as you know, uh, colposcopy even at that age, PAPs at that age. Um, and then uterine anomalies, which is a little bit more, even though it's uncommon, that might be something you would see in this age group. So thinking about management, the first thing you want to do is to add some traction with your tenaculum, to think about changing the angle of your sound, or if you're using a, a rigid sound, to actually bend the sound so you can mimic the flexion. Um, when, when I think about if this was a patient who we thought was, was antiverted or anti-flex, um, to, to um, to angle, you actually want to mimic the angle. So you would do that by uh, actually trying to create, recreate the angle that you think uh, is the um, angle of the uterus. And then the second thing you would do is to try a flexible sound. Uh, I'll show you some images here in a moment, or an Oz finder or a dilator. And after that, uh, you or to do those things, um, I would not really generally consider at that point, uh, 
paracervical block. That's it. Uh, it's an advanced skill. But if you are using going to be doing a little bit of dilation, then I would recommend it. But just for a flexible sound, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, then another thing that you can do is to use a short wide speculum or to open the blades. And so if you think of the, the blades of the speculum, if you open the blades, again, if here's your uterus, when you open the blades, you actually do a little untucking of the uterus. Um, for that matter, another thing you can do is have uh, the patient put a little pressure on their abdomen, lower abdomen, and that can also help to straight out a flexed uterus. And then um, if you happen to have, and probably in most school-based health centers, you wouldn't have ultrasound, but if you have ultrasound, um, say in some of our family planning settings, then you can go ahead and use ultrasound guidance. This is an image of an IUD. More specifically, this is probably an image of a copper IUD because you see that bright white um, the entire along the entire length. When you're doing ultrasounds of levonorgestrel IUDs, often you will see um, a, more like a shadowing um, where you see it kind of a, like a black line underneath the bright white. Um, and I often recommend uh, getting some, if you have ultrasound available, getting some practice with ultrasounds right after you place an IUD instead of trying to learn how to do localization when you don't really know if the IUD is there or not. Uh, and then the other things are never hesitating to repeat your exam, taking everything out and repeating your exam to get more assurance of the position. And then if you happen to have another provider in clinic that day, grab them or refer. Um, and uh, it's fine to refer at, you know, at any uh, point. You don't have to, in this uh, situation, you don't have to wait any particular time. You can get the next available appointment. Great. I wanted to show just uh, the some of the images of what uh, things look like. So actually, this is a little bit of an old fashioned um, dilator, graduated dilator set. Um, the ones that we have look a little bit more like what you see in B, either in plastic or in metal, um, or in C. And the difference with C is just that you see kind of like the, the stops there in the middle. That's a, a Deniston dilator. And I really like, it's a, it's a type of dilator I really like because it doesn't allow you to go too far or too, uh, too deep um, with your dilator. And then what you see down below is uh, a couple of images of Oz finders. Oz finders I like to have in clinics uh, where you're doing IUD insertions. They, you'll notice that they do have a graduated tip. Um, however, with Oz finders, notice also that the tip is fairly pointy. Um, it makes these, and, and they're rigid, it makes these something I like to have around, uh, but I don't, I would probably, if you have a dilator, use a, a flexible sound or a dilator instead, uh, just because that pointy tip can, can sometimes, um, if you push too hard, it can lead to uh, false tractor or perforation. Okay, this is, if you're gonna be doing uh, dilation or even for sounding, I just wanted to briefly go over uh, the, the hand grasp. So the hand grasp you wanna use is what we call a pencil grasp. And the reason why we use a pencil grasp is that it, it doesn't exert so much pressure um, that you're actually pushing in a particular direction. It allows when the uh, dilator or os whatever instrument you're working with, it allows that instrument to sort of redirect in the position of the um, of the cervical os. And so, if you have flexion, it will automatically, uh, with that pencil grasp, it will tend to uh, redirect in the right direction. Um, one other thing that I like to do is have my little pinky out here, either on the patient's leg or on the speculum, so that as I'm going in, again, I don't go too far too vast, fast, and that kind of gives me some stabilization. Um, a lot of people ask about obesity um, and whether or not this makes uh, intrauterine uh, pr procedures more difficult or IUD insertions more difficult. It can make your exam a, a bit harder because you don't get the feedback from the abdominal hand. But in um, one small study where they were looking, comparing normal BMI, BMI less than 30 versus over 30, what they found is, was reassuring. And it showed that the time of this particular type of, this was not with IUD insertions, but it showed that 
um, the time of the procedure was not specifically different, that it, there, the need for a, a longer speculum was about 6% of patients, it wasn't that common, and that the provider difficulty score was maybe one point different, but not sig statistically significant. So I just like to give that as a little bit of reassurance that usually it's not that much harder. And that has been my uh, experience. Um, I just wanted to point out, if you're having trouble getting the cervix in view, um, you, there's a few things you can do. So you could have either the patient or with the assistance um, of your staff, um, do something like a McRoberts position, which um, changes kind of the angle. You can use foot stirrups. If you have controls on your table, you can lift the foot of the table to bring the cervix into view. Um, also, you can use a, a, a wider speculum in general. We don't recommend Peterson speculums for, or specula for IUD insertions, but more like a Graves or a more Graves speculum like you see on the right. I know in a lot of school-based centers, you're using um, uh, the plastic lighted speculum and that's usually going to be, it's not gonna be as narrow as a Peterson. It's gonna be more like a more, a more or a Graves speculum. So that's fine. Um, there's also a nice trick for obesity, which is uh, the condom trick. You can also use the, the finger of a glove and essentially you cut off the finger and then you have something that's like a condom and then you cut off either the condom tip or the, the, the very tip and you slide it around the, the speculum. And what that does is it kind of provides pressure on the lateral walls so that if you have a lot of vaginal wall redundancy, it just sort of spreads it to the sides. Okay, let's move on to a second case. And just to, to remind folks that if you have questions, uh, go ahead and text them in as we go, and I'm happy to try and answer them as we go, or we can go back as needed. So our second case is a 21-year-old nulliparous patient who is, comes in, is very anxious about the procedure and about the pain of IUD placement and has sort of describes himself as, as having a low pain threshold. They've had a... Um, history of painful periods, which it turns out is a predictor of, uh, of some things having to do with IUD insertion. And they um, feel somewhat, you go ahead with the procedure, but they feel somewhat faint during the IUD placement. So I want to think for a moment about predictors of pain. And one of our studies that really is very elucidating is that uh, when our studies compare uh, patient perception of pain versus provider perception of pain, um, we rate things much lower than patients do. So they, on average, uh, patients on average um, rate their IUD insertions at about a six to seven out of 10, and we rate them about a three to four out of 10. So I think it's important to be, you know, I think we're still doing research in this area and to, really think about doing all we can to, to really help our patients with pain. Um, pain predictors, one of them is never having had a vaginal delivery at any age. I mentioned in this case, the patient had a history of menorrhagia or painful periods, but a history of intermenstrual bleeding or menorrhagia is one of the predictors, but also what their expectation is of pain. And this has a lot to do with how we talk about what they're likely, what they should be expecting with pain. Also, if it's a difficult procedure, like the first one I described, where you have trouble getting in and you need to do extra things, that can make it a little bit more painful. And then um, there's also uh, the same studies have the, the same studies have shown that post insertion, insertion pain is a in the uh, first couple of weeks is a predictor for nulliparous adolescence. And you know that might just be again something to give people an idea of as you're counseling them about expectations and anticipatory guidance. So I'm not doing this as a poll, but I want, want you to think for yourselves, which of these has the least evidence for assisting with pain for IUD insertion? So the choices include paracervical block, trauma-informed pelvic care, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, topical lidocaine, and specifically, I'm asking about 10% versus what we really have access here to in the United States, which is 2%. And then lastly, mesoprostol. And what we know is the answer to this question is mesoprostol. So what happens with mesoprostol, um, and it doesn't matter if this is adolescent patients, it turns out that uh, mesoprostol is not very useful 
uh, it doesn't really make it easier for providers. It doesn't really increase the success of IUD insertion. And it tends to make um, patients crampier and it's harder to schedule and it's logistically somewhat challenging if you're setting it up as a prescription. So for many reasons, we don't recommend mesoprostol. Just to briefly touch on these, I'm going to be talking more about paracervical block, and most studies suggest that paracervical block is helpful, really helpful to know about trauma-informed care and lots you can do with that. NSAIDs, although there's not a lot of data on NSAIDs um, as being helpful, there's not a big downside, and I'll say more about that in a second. Um, and then lidocaine, we mostly have access to 2%, which has not been shown to be effective for pain management. There is a, one a randomized trial of 10% lidocaine, but it's hard to get in this country. Uh, it was a study done in Turkey, and I've seen it available online for tattoo environments, but I have not seen it available through pharmacies, but maybe that will change in the future. So just a little more evidence about that. Most of the studies on paracervical lidocaine, um, and this is an advanced tech, uh, an advanced skill, and I will show you, tell you a little more about it. Uh, when we think about trauma-informed care, there are many details. I noticed that in the morning sessions, there were two different sessions having to do with trauma-informed care, so there's a lot to it. But some things to note are helpful language. So I avoid uh, language that, you know, when people ask about it, is this going to be painful, which is a common question. One way I answer that is I say, it's a very short procedure. It can be, it can, the, the response or pain really ranges from patient to patient. So I can't tell you what you will experience, but here are three things that you can do to really help to make that pain a little bit more manageable. So one is slow, deep, easy breathing. Two is that we'll have some conversation because distraction can be helpful. And three is if you have the urge to clench, which is normal, instead try and push your hips down into the table and that will help to keep everything more open so that you're not clenching against the instruments. And um, another thing that I just like to point out to other providers is I try to avoid the phrase relax if people are getting tense um, because that is one example of a phrase that a lot of I don't know if a lot, but it, it's come up as a trigger for some patients who had a history of abuse um, or assault, uh, just because it's been something that perpetrators have said. Um, so we try and just go back to saying, okay, breathe a little bit more deeply or just to using those other techniques. Okay, moving right along. Um, there's a little more data for um, oral ketorolock, but most of us don't have it. Apparently, naproxen and Motrin aren't so helpful, but again, there's not a big downside, and I think most of us are still using them. They do help with post-IUD uh, cramping. And then, as I mentioned, uh, these are the things below are things that don't have a lot of evidence. So I'm there. I like to say about paracervical block one that it's an advanced skill. Don't you know if you have if it's a skill you have in your wheelhouse, try to bring other new providers in with you and show them how to do it. Um, uh, and that's true of any advanced skills. If you and if you're new, don't be intimidated and feel you have to do this. But here's my approach to it. It's certainly something that's in the scope of practice of everyone, uh, of all clinicians. So. Um, one thing to know about it is that uh, it is an art. It is not, this, the science around it shows a few things. It shows that uh, it is effective. It shows that it works partially as a pressure block and not just as an anesthetic block. So even uh, studies that have showed, that have compared saline to anesthetic are almost as, as successful. Some patient or some providers like to use a cough technique when you're giving the lidocaine, where you have them essentially, I often like to, to actually show them, give me a cough on three, one, two, three. And, uh, and essentially that's a distractor. It also gives you a little Valsalva uh, and, um, and uh, really helps to, uh, it, we, it's been shown to be effective with um, biopsies, uh, not, not specifically with IUD insertion or paracervical block, but it, it, it can be effective. And then um, what I, I'm just going to advance to the next and show you what I do. So I usually do about two cc's up at the, uh, where 
superficially where I'm going to place the tenaculum. This, this is not a, this is actually an atraumatic tenaculum, um, which we don't use a lot for nulliparous patients. Usually people have a tooth tenaculum. So then I place my tenaculum and then you can get a little better visualization by moving your tenaculum from side to side. My, the places, there are many places that you can give injections shown here, and they tend to be right at the reflection of the cervical tissue onto the vaginal tissue. So right into that corner and you go, you inject by going in about two, uh, in about two centimeters and out. So I inject while I go in and out instead of pulling back on the needle. Uh, you can either is fine, um, but that also will keep, you, you know that you'll be in a, a vessel at some point, but you won't be in it for long. So that's another alternate, that's a, a good technique. So I tend to do four or five and then um, seven or eight uh, right at that point that I mentioned. So which of the following, so this patient also seemed to be having a vasovagal. So which of the following would not be helpful with vasovagal management? So I'm just gonna tell you that Trendelenburg is very helpful. Um, clenching of extremities such as grabbing the opposite arm and squeezing and then releasing and squeezing and then releasing is a very nice technique and it helps to bring more blood back to the center but also helps on a uh, on a it helps to abort the the vasovagal also ice packs are helpful and smelling salts or ammonia help to cause sort of a, a sympathetic response um, it's a it's a strong smell um, it causes sympathetic response. People don't like it so much. Uh, that also causes more vasoconstriction. And what you don't want to do is stand the patient up. So um, what are other signs? So patients often have a low blood pressure and a pulse, but some other signs can be that they get, uh, they feel dizzy or faint, that they want to vomit. Another common misconception and important uh, one is to know that um, some people will report that they have to uh, have to use the restroom. And that's actually an early sign of a vasovagal. So don't stand them up and have them go out to use the restroom. Um, instead, try some of these other things. Um, so risks include uh, predispositions such as they faint easily or they faint when they um, are about to get their, or when they are getting a blood draw or something like that. Anything you do with cervical stimulation can cause, um, can cause a vasovagal, but also high levels of anxiety and um, hypovolemia. Um, so anxiety, A, we can work with. Hypovolemia, B, just keep in mind, particularly if you work in an area that gets hot during the summer, if patients come in, they've walked into clinic or taken the bus in, Make sure they're, they're nice and cool. They've had ice water or something like that um, to drink before you start your procedure. So I already kind of mentioned these. All, most of these work by increasing venous return. So actually the first technique I talked about, that isometric, isometric contractions of the extremities, um, our colleague, some of you may have heard her speak before, um, Patty Kaysen uh, has written about that. Um, there's a nice article on Bedsider about it, but you, um, she states that she has been doing this pro, pro, prophylactically or preventatively for patients and hasn't had vasovagals for 10 years of doing IUDs, and she does a lot of them. Um, I use it a little bit more as a first thing that I go to um, because I do a lot of intrauterine procedures. So that's that I, I don't do it as preventatively. That being said, it's just certainly something you can do. I wanted to teach you one other trick, which is for Trendelenburg, if you have, if you have taken the speculum out, you can also uh, place the patient's feet up on your shoulder and just kind of calm them a little bit. And that's also a really nice technique. Okay. Um, moving right along, I'm going to uh, pick up the pace a little bit. So missing threads, we have a 23-year-old G3P1 patient for 11 adjuster IUD, sorry, who's had 11 adjuster IUD for 10 months, reports light periods uh, for six months, and then suddenly they've gotten heavier. And the patient was somebody who checked threads and was unable to feel threads. So comes in and when you check on the exam, you notice they have no threads visible. So a couple of thoughts. One is, yeah, the, the threads might have ascended, but the sec and, or, and they might have ascended and perhaps this is even a sign of a perforation uh, with an intra-abdominal intra um, 
uh, IUD that gets going to be very, very rare. Much more common is going to be uh, just that they've ascended or that the IUD has come out, that it has been expulsed. So how do we evaluate this and how do we manage it? So here are some of the um, tools that we use. Uh, and I would say <laughs> this is for difficult IUD removal, but also the first two of these are also used for um, you could consider these for missing threads. So these are things that any of you can have in your clinic and or stock, the first two. Um, so <clears throat> Cytobrush we use for pap tests and you can just, uh, first of all, you want to know if the patient, if the patient has the IUD, whether they want to keep it in place, because that depends how, how vigorously do you use the Cytobrush. <coughs> Um, and then a thread retriever is also something you can do just with a tenaculum in place, and you don't need to do any dilation to use a thread retriever. Um, sounding or using the other, um, like an IUD hook alligator or a, uh, MVA is a manual vacuum aspirator. All of those can work, um, but we, for those three, we usually recommend using a paracervical block first which is, as I mentioned, an advanced skill. My favorite, so I'll, I'll just have, I can send out in, um, or if one of my colleagues happens to be on, um, there's, uh, well, I can send out uh, information about the thread retriever um, if people want that information. Uh, but my favorite go-to is the alligator forcept. Um, so I often will do a paracervical block, though you don't absolutely have to. Um, the nice thing about alligator over the uh, IUD hook is that you can, once you go through the internal oz or to a certain depth, you can, in any plane, you can grasp and you grasp the strings, grasp any part of the IUD, it'll come out. So it doesn't uh, depend on alignment. So first thing to do though in clinic is to rule out pregnancy, both you can take a history and also a pregnancy test. Um, then th uh, probing for threads with the cytobrush and then attempting removal, as I mentioned, with or without a pair of cervical block. And if you're not able to get it out or get the strings out, then providing backup contraception. After that, if you're unsuccessful, you wanna order an ultrasound or a x-ray. And what I do is I order the x-ray reflexly. So if, the, they, if they don't see the ultrasound, sorry, if they don't see the IUD on ultrasound, then I have them go back and just do an x-ray at that point. And then if the, the uh, ultrasound shows that the IUD happens to be, or the x-ray, it, uh, in the abdomen, then that would be a prompt referral. I've never seen that happen myself. Um, this is a very rare thing. And then just a quick note that I think I mentioned this before, but we are no longer, there's pretty good data showing that patients don't regularly check strings and um, that many patients find it a, a um, kind of a barrier to the idea, IUD, the idea of using an IUD if they had to check strings. Uh, so we just aren't really recommending it. I usually have, like I said, patients feel their strings uh, after I place it, um, just I hand them the string. Okay, moving along. Oh, I, I wanted to give you one other um, idea about uh, complicated IUD removal. Let's just say uh, the, the string, the patient wants the IUD out, you go to pull on the string, but you get a fair bit of resistance. So the question is, how hard do you pull on the string? And what I want to say and reassure you with is that about 50% of the time, if you pull a little harder on the string, the IUD will just come out. Um, the best counsel that I've gotten on this question is one of my former um, medical directors that I worked with for many years used to always say that if we referred that patient to to him, the first thing he was going to do was pull hard. And um, so, so that's something to know. About 50% of the time it's successful and uh, it is uh, definitely something that, you know, you don't, you know, you don't want to pull so hard that it's causing a lot of symptomatology for or pain for the patient. Um, but the other thing is if you've tried and you can't get it out, then you can uh, refer for advanced imaging to direct uh, treatment. So again, that would be uh, generally an ultrasound uh, would be helpful and that, that ultrasound can help determine whether hysteroscopy, laparoscopy or laparotomy. 
would be uh, the, the recommendation in that case. Okay, moving right along. Uh, one thing that really improves, there's a nice study um, that really uh, speaks to some steps that you can take for improving your own uh, IUD placement. And this was a study done uh, that was a per prospective intervention trial with uh, six family planning sites in Utah. And what they did is they did an intervention when they, where they trained their providers how to do paracervical blocks and how to do dilation. And what they found is that after the intervention, their failure rates went from 13% to 4%. But also, once they controlled for uh, both patient and provider characteristics, they found nearly a five-fold odds of success. And I think this just speaks to the idea that the more experience that you have doing things in and around the cervix and the uterus, and the, the better you get at navigating um, uh, the challenging scenarios. So if you have, again, if you have these advanced skills, teach them to others, if you don't, uh, then uh, I really recommend trying to get them if you have anybody in your, in your environment that has these skills. So for IUD in summary, use models to refresh your skills. Do, use a careful by manual exam. So when I say models, I mean keep your models available. And if it's been a little while since you've done these IUDs, practice before you go in the room. Do a careful by manual exam as I described. Use adequate traction on your tenaculum for IUD insertions because that will really help to, to straighten out the uterus. And then we wanna think about trauma-informed care and uh, paracervical blocks plus or minus uh, NSAIDs, or I should say NSAIDs plus or minus paracervical blocks because I know that's a, uh, an advanced skill. And then also just if you have advanced skills or even if you are not, you're somebody who places IUDs, then think of yourself as a potential trainer um, and, and really start thinking about, uh, you know, we're, the one way we can scale up on getting more people trained in this skill is to, yeah, really help train each other. And so getting, helping to share the advanced skills that you have. Great, I'm gonna go on to implant cases. Um, I don't know, Nina, whether we've had any questions come in yet, but we I'll go ahead. Oh, uh, we do have a couple of questions. Would you like to answer them now? Um, yeah. I think this goes earlier. So um, my question relates to aftercare as I see these patients in my office a few days to a couple of weeks post-procedure. Most have vaginal and or lo lower abdominal pain. How long after uh, IUD insertion is pain to be expected? And what about bleeding? Yes, so I say um, one to two weeks is common, um, but for the first month is also pretty common. What I actually like to do um, is to do a follow-up after the first period. So I do a follow-up more like, well, first of all, I don't routinely always do a follow-up. I do a follow-up and it's fine in your settings, you know, adolescents and people who are newer to IUDs or who are very nervous about it, um, it's fine to schedule one, but I, the reason I do that is it gives me a little more water under the bridge. How did the first cycle go? Um, and, and uh, you know, what are they likely to expect with bleeding after that? Also, the first, uh, you know, with time, your risk of expulsion goes down. So that's still kind of in that, that window of risk for expulsion is in that first, you know, four to six weeks. So I like to do them at six weeks if I'm going to do them. What other questions? Yes, so uh, some students say the string is gone or and are worried. Is this a significant concern? What could this indicate? So as I mentioned before, um, if the string is missing, it can be those three things. So it can be that the IUD has come out. It can be that it's just floated. What we now know from ultrasound studies of patients with IUDs is there's a little bit of movement of the IUD within the uterus. So where the uterus, where it, we still try to get fundal placements up at the top of the uterus, it's really only becomes a, a, a big concern in terms of uh, malpositioning or, or partial expulsion if part of the IUD is inside the cervix. Uh, but anyway, it can be because the uh, IUDs have climbed up into the uterus. That's the most common. Um, and, then, uh, and then it can be, an, uh, a, a, as I mentioned, a, a perforation. 
So I think I'm going to keep us moving because we have, okay. I just want to get us into some implant things and then we'll, we'll circle back. Okay. Just going to get us through a few more cases and then we'll circle back to the rest of the questions. So implants, the complication frequency with implants is about 0.3 to 1% of insertions and about 0.2 to 1.7% of removals. There are two big, uh, uh, studies that came out in 2017 and 18. One was the Nexplanon Observational Risk Assessment Study and then the FDA Ad Adverse Event Reporting System. And both of these studies really helped to inform the, the new placements uh, the new uh, site for placement that everybody is get has is getting trained in now. So the the in uh, the complications that they saw included infection, local irritation or rash, hematoma, expulsion of of an implant, allergic reaction, and the two things that they're seeing a lot less of with the new placement sites are migration and intravascular placement. Uh, so I won't spend as much time talking about those things, but I do want to just give you the updated tips for insertion. So uh, they recommend no longer placing in the sulcus or in the groove between your bice biceps and your triceps, and they recommend three to five centimeters um, posterior or uh, really over the triceps, three to five centimeters from that groove. So I have my patients make a muscle, and I'm a fan of marking the skin um, with my placements. And then you want to mark measuring eight to 10 centimeters, whoops, eight to 10 centimeters from the medial epicondyle. And um, then one of the other new recommendations that they have is they always said angling 30 degrees, but now they really recommend trying to look from the side when you are doing your angling so that you can kind of double, double check. If you're only looking from above, you can't really tell that angle. And then after placement, you want to palpate both ends, not just to see if you can feel the implant, but make, make sure that you can palpate both ends. And also, we still recommend having the patient feel. Um, okay, so the first case, you have a partial expulsion of the implant. So this is a 19-year-old who had an implant placed, and af as you remove the applicator, that th there's a three millimeter tip of the implant that pops out through the skin. Why does this occur? So what we know is that it happens because of incompleting, incompletely pulling back on the slider before you, before you start to remove the inserter. And this sort of shows that you have to remove to pull all the way back and only until you get all the way where you can't go any further do you remove the slider. So um, don't, what we, we know that's important is that you don't wanna try and push the implant in at that point or tape it or fix it because it's just gonna come out under pressure. So just remove it and start over. And generally you can send uh, the implant, this implant back through your, uh, your local uh, representative um, and usually get credited for it. Okay, so deep, case two is deep placement. So you have a 27 year old uh, patient with implant who wants removal. Uh, to get pregnant. And this is, I, I, I should probably just change this case for you all to a 17 year old. Um, but anyway, during removal, you, the rod is palpable, but it will not move into the incision with finger pressure. So how do you manage this? Um, so first of all, I want to just bring your attention to the pop out technique. And um, this is a, a really good and perhaps I'll, I'll ask uh, Nina or Julia, if you're on to go ahead and put this um, website into the chat. This is uh, not, it's, it's a video that is fantastic and shows a number of cases um, using the pop-out technique. I'm just gonna describe it here in a second. But the pop-out technique is just slightly different than the, what the company is teaching because um, it's, it requires less anesthesia, it causes less bruising and it's, I find it quicker and easier. So you palpate both ends, you press on the proximal end to help lift up the distal end. If you can't feel the implant, you um, don't want to attempt removal. And then you, uh, once you know that you can feel the proximal end, you draw up um, half to one millimeter of lidocaine and you give a five millimeter wheel um, make sure if you've marked your, your implant temp that you don't go right into that spot. So you can go just off of it. Um, you can use a TB syringe and then you manip manipulate the rod with the rest of your fingers, both hands, and that will kind of help to stabilize um, uh, that, uh, the tip. And then when you're pushing the rod against the incision with that finger pressure, you hold it in place and then you 
um, you make a little two millimeter longitudinal incision and you nick the fibrous sheath of the rod with the scalpel blade. blade. And this can take several nicks. I like to cross hatch. And then um, the rod usually will kind of come into view. It just sort of pops into view. And then you continue to exert finger pressure on the proximal end to push the distal end through the incision and then grasp it with your fingers or a mosquito and make sure you can feel all four centimeters. Um, tips for removal if it's a deep in insertion or, diff or difficult are to use your gauze and that scalpel to continue to loosen the fibrous uh, capsule and grasp by the end, not by the diameter, never by the diameter, unless you're using an instrument I'm going to show you in a moment, and apply minimal traction. You may need a little bit more lidocaine, you may need to extend the incision a little bit, and you may need to dissect with a straight mosquito, but that's not how I start. And then you just want to know that after 15 minutes of trying, you want to refer to a specialty center um, and just stop. Just call it good after 15 minutes. And you want to make that appointment one to two weeks uh, later so that the swelling that you have resolves. I want to um, bring your attention to one other instrument that's really nice to have. This is, again, an advanced technique. Um, this is called a modified vasectomy forceps, and it has a less than two millimeter tip. And with this technique, you could make an incision next to the implant, to the, the longitudinal line of the implant. And then you would insert the modified vasectomy forcept and gently pull the implant out of the incision and then use a second forcep to grasp it. So this is kind of a, an alternative technique to the, um, to the, if you say if you were unsuccessful with the pop-out technique. If you're not able to, to palpate the implant, as I mentioned, don't attempt. It's not urgent. And we generally want to refer these people uh, for localization with imaging. You want to make sure they're on a uh, contraceptive method. Um, it depends uh, generally where you would uh, send them also for removal is a place. And you can do both of these in the same environment. Um, you can send. Be, and I say that because some of those providers, so those would be specialty centers, for example, where they have a family family planning training program uh, or um, fellowship. Um, uh, certainly, uh, those are in OBGYN specialty centers largely. And some of those providers like to use uh, x-ray or high frequency ultrasound. Uh, they, some like to use ultrasound guidance and work with sort of interventional radiology folk um, or a CT or an MRI. Um, and just to know that if you happen to have ultrasound in your site, it takes a high frequency ultrasound to see these, but it appears kind of like the IUD in that, or the Levin adjuster IUDs in that you get that shadowing um, kind of below the echogenic spot. Um, okay, moving right along. Third case, and i um, just going to go through this one pretty quickly so we still have a, a little bit of time for questions. So this is a patient with frequent bleeding and who requests removal. This is a 22-year-old who had their, their next bone inserted last month and calls complaining that they're bleeding every single day and calls to schedule the removal like to point out that this is one reason why it's nice to have our front desk and our counselors, everybody a little bit familiar with who, you know, what services you offer, but also uh, just the notion we're really shifting. And I had to get comfortable. This is a provider. We're shifting towards uh, suggesting that, yes, your, your, your IUD or implant could be removed on the day that you request it and starting the conversation that way. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have some counseling if they're open to it about it. So we're going to walk through that. So what percentage of Nexplanon users experience irregular bleeding? It turns out that it's about 80%. And then um, this just shows that, that uh, it's a 20% amenorrhea, 20% frequent irregular bleeding, and 60% are infrequent irregular bleeding. And just in how to talk with patients about these expectations, probably even better than saying 80% is eight out of every 10 and showing them an image. This just helps across the literacy uh, ranges. Uh, we don't always have the resources available to do that, but even just saying eight out of every 10 is very helpful. So what percent of next one on users experience in improvement in bleeding? And it turns out that's about 50% of that 80%. So uh, some of you may have heard me go through this on a call or on, sorry, on a, 
uh, in this a session yesterday, but this is a nice dialogue that you might consider about how to empathize with them and then see how they, you know, reassure them that they can get the IUD or implant out that day. I'm at this point saying either, because um, this is pertinent to, to kind of early requests for either. So it sounds like you're having some very bothersome, like this bleeding is very bothersome for you. And that is an example of empathizing. When can you, sorry, we can remove your implant today and I'm happy to do that. That's reassurance. We can also talk about some options that would allow you to keep the implant but could make the bleeding better. Uh, would you be interested in learning more about these options? And that is just eliciting patient preferences. So this is kind of an example of shared decision-making in the context of a, um, sort of a complication or consideration. So if they're open to it, then you might assess for non-implant related causes of bleeding. So, um, you know, when was their last normal menstrual period? Uh, do, you could do a pregnancy test in clinic. Uh, you might considering doing, uh, you know, pelvic exam that checks for uh, vaginitis and uh, doing, uh, you know, cultures or urine-based testing. And then kind of probably at the next visit, if they're, they're still considering it, I don't think at that point I send, um, but you could certainly do a history for, you know, painful periods and then some of the uh, thyroid uh, symptoms, changes in bleeding, weight, hair, energy, et cetera. Um, so how do we manage this? We want to think about our evidence-based interventions, and these are our, um, our three uh, sort of key things that we want to try. So non anti-inflammatory uh, medications. Um, generally, we're thinking about six to 800 milligrams of Motrin uh, three times a day for, this is the most common one, although there are others, for about five days, oral contraceptives. You can also use uh, estrogen, so um, that would be uh, oral contraceptives or uh, estrogens you could do for one to two weeks. The oral contraceptives you can do up for up to a month. That's certainly fine to do it for up to a month. That just kind of can provide also an easy follow-up time. And then doxycycline would be another thing to try. And doxycycline actually, it turns out, I used to think that was be, we'd offer it because of occult infections, but more of the reason that we do it is to um, it actually helps to stabilize the uterine lining, uh, and, and that has been shown in a study of uh, implant bleeding. This just goes over those options and the dosing of those options, but also goes over some things that we use a little less commonly. The, the final three, mifepristone, tamoxifen, and ulipristal acetate are all uh, selective progestin uptake uh, modulators, and they've been shown to be helpful for uh, implant-related bleeding. We, like I said, we just we don't use them as as commonly. Uh, one of the go-to places uh, is the selective practice recommendations that, uh, and the appendix E is something that I uh, recommend to clinicians quite a lot. That just goes over all your different methods and what what to consider in the management of um, bleeding irregularities using these methods. Okay, so this patient turns out decides they want to in, keep the implant, implant and ask you about options to manage bleeding. They take a pack of OCPs and uh, turns out that their gonorrhea and chlamydia test comes back negative. And I could put this in here in part just to, it's sort of a good checkpoint for ourselves. How many of us felt a little more comfortable when the patient decided that they wanted to keep their implant? And that is probably part of the learning curve for all of us as providers, again, I, my own practice has really shifted in the last, um, in the last, I would say, year or two around this issue. In that, I'm, I'm really recognizing that um, our continuation rates for IUDs and implants are around 80 uh, percent, and I am just a little less worried if they want to have them out sooner. And um, this is true both of any, at any age, but also true of adolescence, that compared to short acting methods, there's at least double the continuation rate at three years for adolescence um, compared to short acting methods. So I just am a little less worried about it. There's also more and more conversation about the idea, particularly during COVID, but in general, about talking about self-removal um, of IUDs. And I don't know that I would do that with, with um, off the 
off the bat with adolescent patients, but it's something that we're getting more accustomed to and there's more and more data on it. So why is all this important that you reassure patients up front of, that they can have an implant or an IUD removed that day? Um, in a study that looked at, uh, at, at when patients could get their LARC removed, over one in four, it was later that they wanted than they wanted. And it turned out that this was um, two months later that they wanted on average. And um, the reasons that they reported were uh, that it was, the number one reason what it, was that it was hard to get an appointment sooner. That's gonna be even harder during COVID, but I'm not sure in your, in your settings, but uh, even, even harder for most patients. And then also that providers, uh, it's still, uh, many providers are still recommending patients to encourage or to encourage keeping it. And I know um, even just from our call yesterday or the session yesterday that, um, that's still part of the protocols in some settings. And like I said, it's just something that I'm really moving towards uh, recommending. Our program is really moving towards recommending a shift on that because so many patients have felt that that can be a little coercive and, uh, and uh, upsetting. And it, yeah, I would just say, how would you feel? Uh, you know, how would any of us feel um, for that matter if they really wanted something out? And then also just this notion that we recommend they have multiple appointments. So let's, you know, make sure that you know, you wait until you can come back and we, we give you a trial. Um, and I just, again, I'm moving, tending to move away from that as are most of our programs. So quick uh, summary points on implants, uh, placing again over the triceps, three to five centimeters from the sulcus, uh, careful angling and looking from the side, using the pop-out technique, which can minis minimize the need for anesthesia, uh, can minimize the pain and also the need to do ex uh, extensions, it minimizes rod fracturing, bleeding, and bruising. And then this is probably my number one key takeaway for the whole session, which is that we're really moving towards investing in the patient's experience. This really comes back to that shared decision-making piece, rather than the specific method that the patient chooses or the outcome, i.e. keeping an IUD or an implant, um, or ending up with a, you know, a particular method. We're really trying to emphasize more and more that the patients are have the expertise in their own life and what's going to work for them. And um, I know that's, I think, for all of us, a learning curve. I just think we're seeing more and more literature that really describes um, the experiences of patients and how the outcomes really vary with what we're doing. Okay, let's go to a few questions for the last couple minutes of our session. Yes, um, I just wanted to th uh, thank you for that. Um, so one question is actually coming from a high school um, health office setting with a school nurse. So um, what is considered abnormal bleeding with implanted hormone devices? Is it normal to have vaginal bleeding when the device is re-implanted at the three month mark? And what about a first time implantation? So um, lots of <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I understand exactly what you mean by the re-implant. The, by the three month mark. But what I can tell you is that, um, well, you, you saw the slide where I was showing what the overall, the way I describe implant bleeding is, and I've heard it described in different ways. I like to say overall on average, it's more favorable, meaning more, uh, th that, pa that more patients experience uh, less bleeding days and more spotting than bleeding. However, it breaks up into one third, one third, one third. So approximately one third will have a little, uh, of those who, yeah, approximately one third will have amenorrhea over time. Approximately one third will have uh, lighter bleeding and maybe the other third is gonna have slightly heavier bleeding. That, that's something that you can say, make sure they're comfortable with that. Um, some, some do say that that first three or some research shows that that first three month period is the, is the highest likelihood of having uh, frequent heavier bleeding, and then that the, that can go down over time. Um, was there set part two to that question? Um, I think it was answered um, earlier. Okay. Um, okay. Another question is, uh, I guess, in regards to bleeding or spotting as well, can you please discuss tranexamic acid for treatment of persistent spotting after IUD placement if a teen is unhappy with the bleeding? Yes, I can. It is a, a um, another option to try, and it's something that affects the the uh, platelet um, co uh, the, the the platelet process in coagulation. Uh, 
Um, it can be used and I'm happy to also, if people, if that person or anybody else who wants that information can just chat in your email, I'm happy to send out the dosing information on it. Um, it is sort of a, a I, I, for me, it's um, kind of a, it's along those lines of the additional working with um, the selective progestin and uh, uh, receptor um, medications in that it's not my, it's not the primary thing that I would try, but it's something that you can think of as, as, as an alternative. Thank you. Great. And, and, and that's it uh, for this session. Okay. Uh, Yes. Just want to again thank everyone and also chat in if you would like to uh, give us your emails if you would like to get a copy of the uh, presentation um, or if you have other specific questions and we're happy to get back to you on those. And again, I just want to thank you all. And thanks, Nina. Thank you so much. <laughs>